Приветствуем вас на вечерней части Russian Python Week, третий день. И сегодня, на мой взгляд, одна из самых интересных активностей, потому что мы поговорим с двумя представителями Python Core разработки и PSF. Это два очень уважаемых человека, и большая часть для меня сегодня представляет их. Это Кэрол Уиллин из компании Notable и Дастин Инграм из компании Google. Hi, Кэрол, uh, hi, Дастин. It is really nice to have you here. It's a big pleasure and an honor. Uh, so you joined and agreed to ask, uh, answer our questions. Thanks a lot for joining us. Yeah, it's great to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having us and hello to everybody. Uh, I want to, sh um, uh, to say to our audience uh, that uh, they can ask uh, any questions they have uh, in our chat and I will translate them if they're in Russian and just read it to our guests if they, if these comments are in English. So feel free to post it and I will totally <laughs> uh, ask them. So uh, today we're going to talk about several topics. Uh, about uh, Python Software Foundation, about uh, Python core development, uh, PEPs, and stuff like this, and some uh, topics around it. So let's start with the PSF, because not a lot of Python developers actually know what PSF is and what's the motivation behind it and what are the main objectives of this organization. Dustin, can you please tell us about it? Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, the PSF is a, a nonprofit organization uh, based in the U.S., but operates around the world, obviously. Uh, and the, the goal of the organization is to just advance uh, Python. It sort of owns the intellectual property around Python, so the PSF lo the Python logos and things like that. It sort of is the holder of all that. Uh, and it also uh, is the recipient of funding uh, that helps advance Python in a number of ways. Uh, and then uh, sort of distributes that funding to projects uh, in need. So um, the PSF is sort of comprised, it's pretty small. Um, there is a, a couple paid staff. We have an executive director, a director of infrastructure, and some other staff, um, some accountants and things like that. Uh, and then the PSF also has a board of directors. So I'm one of the directors of the PSF. There are 11 of us total. Um, we are all volunteers. Uh, and we're uh, elected in rounds as an election every year. Um, and our goal is to sort of just guide that organization, um, make decisions on behalf of the PSF, and sort of help uh, ensure that Python lasts for a long time and uh, uh, is available for everyone to use. That's actually a very good question we have. Uh, Python is an open source project. How can Python sustain an organization and some full-time workers uh, who support its community? So I'll, I'll throw this to Carol real quick. Carol, does, does Python itself make any money? Uh, Python the language does not, but I, I was a former director of the PSF as well. And what the PSF does is fundraising through PyCon is, US is one of the big fundraising arms as well as donations. And it's those things that fund a variety of things, including the staff, but also um, the very healthy grant program that we have globally. And from there, I will toss it over to Dustin because he can talk more about what is currently being funded. Yeah. So like Carol said, Python itself really doesn't make money. But um, the PSF derives most of its income, which is several million dollars US a year, from the majority from PyCon. So, uh, PyCon US uh, brings in about 85% of the funds uh, that the PSF needs to operate. And uh, the rest comes from donations and also from sponsorships. So organizations uh, like my employer, Google, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, um, are foundation members of the PSF. They, you know, at different varying levels, contribute funding uh, to help ensure the PSF continues to, to operate. Uh how you said that you both uh, were and is uh, PSF directors, how to become one? How to join PSF and uh, what are levels inside its organization? Yeah, so um, basically um, the process has changed a little bit. When I was on the board, it was a whole new board was elected each year. And what we found over time was 
um, to have continuity from year to year, having that uh, cycled um, uh, nominations and voting um, was much more effective and much more um, uh, gave the board better continuity. So it's not like all your information or knowledge leaves and then you have a whole new batch. Um, but yeah, I mean, Dustin, you probably have some more thoughts on, you know, how it's working now. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, the way that you join the board is that you run. So anybody can run to join the board um, and be a part of the election. You basically write a nomination statement and you're on the board. The hard part is getting elected. So. Um, the folks that tend to get elected are folks that have sort of demonstrated uh, sustained commitment to contributing, acting as volunteers. They have shown that they can invest the time in the organization, uh, and then they they become they can be elected by the community, um, and then they can be uh, uh, elected to the board. Um, but I want to emphasize that you know the, the directors, while we you know help guide the organization, uh, we're a really small part of what the PSF needs to operate, right? And the staff is also a small part. The largest part is all of the volunteers, the folks that are not elected, uh, that are not paid, that work uh, and contribute to the ecosystem, contribute to Core Python, uh, everything outside of Core Python, which there, there's a lot there as well. Um, those are the folks that really uh, ensure that the, the language continues to work. Yeah, things like the work groups, like the grants work group or the code of conduct work group, um, those folks are donating their time, as are many of the meetup groups and the local organizations um, around the world. How is it uh, possible to help uh, PSF if you're just an individual? What are the easiest steps? Well, I think first and foremost, as an individual, um, being a good uh, representative for Python in your local community is really important um, to kind of have that uh, respectful, courteous, professional um, uh, actions in what you do related to Python, um, you know, supporting conferences, and also, um, you know, as I think you get more involved over time, you take on more responsibility or you see what works for you. Um, Dustin? Yeah, how to get involved. Um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of people think that the only way to contribute is to become a core developer or work on core Python. And you know, I want to emphasize that there are just there's so many other ways to contribute. There are so many projects, third party projects uh, that are on PyPI, uh, other ecosystems, other work groups that, that are not core Python that are just as valuable as uh, working on the language itself um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know maybe I wouldn't say that those projects are necessarily easier to contribute to but um, they're definitely they, they need help they want help they uh, encourage new contributors um, as much as core Python does so uh, th those those groups and those organizations are, are good ways to contribute as well yeah There's and I want to point out that it, it doesn't have to be a coding contribution we have many people within the Python ecosystem who are good community organizers, conference organizers, um, uh, conference speakers, educators, as well as people who are documentarians who like writing. So there's a variety of ways that one can contribute. Yeah, and I'll add to that. I really like that you added, uh, mentioned education as well, because one of the things I think about is that um, Python is getting extremely popular. It has been popular for a long time, but it's really taking off. Uh, and there is this whole, there's millions of Python developers that haven't been made yet that are going to come online in like the next 10 years or so. Um, and the more that each of us can do to contribute to their education, making sure that, that they are welcomed into the community, uh, that, that they have a good experience with Python when they first discover it, uh, is going to be crucial to the language, you know, working successfully and having a robust community in the future. Absolutely. Recently, I've seen that uh, a new GitHub organization emerged uh, called PSF. Uh, what is the status of this GitHub organization and what projects uh, are there and to, what was the purpose of this new organization? Yeah, I can take this, Carol, if you want. 
Perfect. Yes. So the PSF GitHub organization is um, sort of the home for projects that are owned by the PSF that are not core Python. So core Python has its own sort of GitHub organization. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that doesn't fall under core Python that the PSF is still involved in. Um, some of the big projects that the PSF works on that aren't core Python include PyPI, but we also want to ensure that um, prominent and popular projects um, that are sort of currently community maintained also have the support of the PSF. So one example of this is the requests project, uh, which is extremely popular, um, was recently transferred to the PSF. So it's now uh, a project of the PSF. It's owned by the PSF and supported by the PSF, uh, which helps us ensure that it will continue to exist, uh, continue to get the support it needs to be uh, widely used. So uh, it is some kind of critical projects that are not uh, in the core of Python, but are critical to the ecosystem. Yeah, the repository also holds, uh, the organization also holds some repositories for um, the work, various working groups that are not related to core Python. So one example is we just started a um, project funding work group. Um, this is a group that's focused on uh, finding funding sources for critical Python projects. Um, so we sort of have started to organize um, some of the resources around that work group in this organization as well. Um, and yeah, I'll add that that work group, uh, lately we've had a lot of success sort of finding external funding to fund very specific Python projects um, from you know, companies and other organizations. Um, for example, Mozilla recently, uh, in the last couple of years, donated a large amount of money to various Python projects to sort of ensure that they are done and um, launch successfully. Okay, thanks a lot because uh... It is a new organization, and I had a lot of questions about it. So thanks for uh, mm -hmm. sure. answering it. Uh, one more question that I heard a lot is about Guido's retirement and what uh, has changed since then, and what's uh, the current status of it. Yeah, do you want me to start with it? Or you've done a whole talk on it. Maybe you should start <laughs> with it. Uh, uh, why don't yeah, you start, I'll and I'll fill in the color. How's that? Sure, yeah. Um, so I, I think most people know that, that Guido has retired at this point and that um, his retirement was sort of brought about by a very specific PEP, uh, which introduced the walrus operator. Uh, I gave a long talk on this. Um, you can watch it. You might find it enjoyable. It sort of explains the PEP and, and also how Python governance works, right? In the past, we had this model where Guido was the benevolent dictator of Python uh, for life. Uh, which meant that he had final say in everything that happened with Python, uh, the language. And, uh, you know, obviously that's not sustainable, right? Gita is not going to live forever. Um, so at some point that had to change. Uh, it changed a little faster, I think, than most folks expected it to. Because um, uh, Guido was sort of just, uh, he'd been working on Python basically the majority of his life and, uh, you know, got burn out, right? It got tired of, uh, of dealing with all of the extra stuff that comes along, the not fun stuff. So uh, sort of respectfully and rightfully, he retired and uh, sort of <laughs> abruptly and left the rest of the community to sort of figure out what to do uh, and figure out how we sort of bootstrap a new governance model. Because uh, if your dictator steps down, right, it's sort of this power vacuum, you have to figure out what to do. Uh, maybe, Carol, you can tell us what happened. Yeah. So, um, pretty much immediately afterwards, Brett and I um, and uh, Talk Python to me was kind enough to kind of give us a platform to kind of share what we thought was going to happen going forward. Um, it was um, certainly a shock, but uh, in terms of the, the timing, we kind of felt like maybe several years down the road it might have happened, uh, but you know, it happened when it, as it happened. And one of the things that Brett and I tried to stress was Python will continue. Python will continue in its day-to-day -day, uh, format for the short term as we um, come up with a new format for governance. And what we did was we took um, probably a two-month period and um, researched other open source projects that we were involved in or uh, familiar with and wrote a pep about 
how those different governance models um, work. Then um, we had a core Python sprint and a bunch of people got together at, um, in Seattle and Guido as well. And, uh, you know, I kind of facilitated the first kind of round table, if you will, where we went through what, what we like about Python as well as what we think is necessary going forward. And from there, we came up with several governance models that then each got turned into PEPs. And from there, the actual core development community voted on which one they felt most strongly about. And that is the steering council model that we have now. Um, it is a loosely governed, but um, there are five people. Um, we want to give as much autonomy as we can to the core developers themselves because they're the ones closest to the code. They're the ones that are, um, you know, seeing the, the guts of the code, if you will. But, um, the, so I was on the inaugural steering council with Nick Coughlin, Guido, uh, Brett, and Barry Warsar. And the one thing that struck me immediately was how much work Guido had been doing and how much had been on his shoulders and spreading it across the five of us was sort of, um, it was a little eye-opening because it, it, I won't say it, it I mean, it's work. I mean, it's definitely work. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, figuring out how to get people to communicate better, how to make decisions if there's like a technical impasse, um, reviewing PEPs. And, you know, I, I think it's worked out really well. I think it's um, minimized the burden on any one person. Um, this is now our, we've been through the second cycle and uh, probably like towards the end of the year, we'll have our third cycle. What we do is we uh, elect a new steering council shortly after a major version of Python is released. And, um, you know, we meet weekly and really it's whatever issues come up during that week, um, typically related to PEPs is, is one of the things or the culture and community around core development. So to make it clear, uh, Steering Council is independent from the Python Software Foundation. It is uh, closely related to the core development of the language. Yeah, I, the, the one thing we did do because we felt like the PSF should be a part of um, the core development Steering Council as well is Eva, the executive director of the PSF, sits in on every one of our steering council meetings and has been a, a great uh, resource and um, sounding board for ideas and uh, improved funding, things like that. So um, it's been really valuable to have her participation as well. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's move to another part, more technical one, because we've mentioned uh, some PEPs already and our audience uh, are already asking <laughs> the technical questions. So uh, <laughs> currently there are a lot of new PEPs uh, ongoing and uh, I want to ask you which ones are your favorite ones and which ones are the most controversial in your opinion? You want to start, Dustin? Uh, which are my favorite peps? When I when I do the the talk about um, the Walrus operator, I talk a little bit about peps and why they're created. And I I do this joke where I say my favorite pep is pep five. Oh, I, oh, I actually forget the number now. It's a pep that I authored. So I always say that's my favorite pep. I can't even remember the number of it now. I've I've been involved in the creation of a couple peps, and the numbers all sort of tend to run together. But um, yeah, some some new and recent peps that I'm excited about. Um, pep. 615, uh, I think that's right, adds a, a time zone database to the Python standard library. I think that's awesome. Uh, it's a ton of work. Uh, Paul Gansel's been working on that project, and uh, I think it's definitely needed in the standard library. 
Uh, I'm pretty excited about an upcoming PEP, which is PEP 632, which is removing the disk utils module from Core oh, Python. Yeah. So there's it's been a long time coming, but basically um, disk utils existed before setup tools and was the way you sort of would distribute Python code, um, third party stuff. And uh, it still kind of exists in the standard library. It's basically uh, unmaintained and implicitly deprecated. So uh, explicitly removing it and deprecating it, I think, is um, sort of the path forward. And there's all sorts of compatibility stuff, backwards compatibility stuff that has to happen there. But uh, I'm excited about it because it, it's a, a foot gun and a problem for a lot of Python users that aren't very familiar with the packaging ecosystem. How about you, Carol? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the PEPs I kind of read as they come through and really form my opinion based on how I would use it within the Jupyter or scientific programming community. And one of the ones I actually find interesting, it's not an approved PEP yet, is the one on pattern matching. Um, we've uh, done a lot of, uh, we've met with the team that is um, uh, proposing the PEP, including Guido, and I have like tried to help them and uh, as well as the other steering council members uh, work through the things that people are finding objections to and to make the PEP much clearer. So actually we may see the PEP being split up into multiple PEPs um, because there's a lot of content in one PEP. And I think you know some of the sections of the PEP may be broken out so that it's a little bit easier. But um, one of the things that I want to make sure we do is have a way to teach the millions of people that use Python how to use pattern matching if they choose and not and and, and sort of have some best practices around it um, and then recognizing that we don't need everything in the first swipe you know, pattern matching and typing and whatever, you know, sometimes you can make the PEP a little smaller and, and more finely scoped and actually wind up with a better solution. So um, I'm excited about it. I don't know if it'll pass or not, but I'm hopeful. Um, but yeah, that, that's probably my favorite one right now. Um, my other one that's sort of that I, I find intriguing that has sort of stalled out a little bit is the one to remove some things from the standard library or to decouple some things from the standard library. And that, I, I think, you know, there's so many, you know, one of the benefits of Python is the strong ecosystem of third party libraries. And in the cases where there's much stronger third-party libraries and not a compelling reason to have something in the standard library, it makes sense to remove it from the standard library versus giving people the, the feeling like, okay, this is being actively maintained when it's only being minimally maintained. Right. Um, yeah, I think the thing that I usually talk to people about when that comes up is that you know, a lot of those are added to the standard library maybe before PyPI existed or before mm -hmm. it worked reliably. So it was really important that, that stuff just came with Core Python. But nowadays, um, the Python package index is robust and available and has lots of fun, interesting projects on it. And it, there is basically less of a demand for that stuff to just come with Core Python, right? It's not too hard to get it and add it to whatever you're trying to do. Also, I want to go back to what you were saying earlier because we you brought up how to teach things in PEPs, specifically the pattern matching. but um, I think that goes back to the education that we were talking about before that's so important because um, one thing I love about PEPs is if you look at um, the, the template for how to write a PEP, it has a how do I teach this section, right? H how do we expect to com communicate this to the wider community? And PEPs are for a technical audience. Uh, the author of a PEP doesn't necessarily expect every single Python user to understand the contents of the PEP, but we do need to sort of be able to explain the change we're proposing uh, in an accessible way to the wider community. Um, so I, I think that that's a really important focus for PEPs as well. Yeah, I mean, that's something I've been really passionate about is having a section in the PEPs for um, 
how to teach the concept because if you can't explain the concept nobody's going to use the concept except for the really super experienced users in very uh, targeted use cases whereas um, if you can at least provide some guidance of how to use it when to use it um, I think it, it it makes it a lot easier for everyone uh, button notching is really um, really controversial idea uh, in Python because it is really cool but it is uh, actually a very hard thing to teach uh, and I understand this uh, motivation behind how I teach uh, this feature because even some functional programmers don't understand how to use button matching correctly when to use it and when not to use it and that's the whole a set of problems over there so right and that's one of the things in the PEP as it's rewritten to really focus in on okay what's the foundational elements like there's foundational elements to a pattern matching statement but then there's other kind of optional things and um, you know I've seen pattern matching for a long time working early on in my career in the telecom industry because Erlang used it and Elixir uses it and Scala and pretty much all the functional languages but um, I think uh, I think Elixir does a good job of teaching it in their documentation. Um, it is, I think sometimes it's more complicated than it needs to be because of the jargon around it. And I think if you do some well-scoped examples, it becomes much easier to understand. So. Um, I think the controversy might have been initially more about the PEP itself than the actual feature itself. It is a really <laughs> uh, nice co coincidence that you mentioned Elixir because uh, Elixir is my second favorite language after Oh, Python. cool. Uh, so I mostly uh, use pattern matching in Elixir, and uh, the coolest thing about it is that you can pattern match on function definitions. Mm -hmm. And that's something is that is missing in this path. So let's kind of bring some confusion in functional programming world to it. Yeah, it's kind of pattern matching, but not fully pattern matching like functional. Language, so. Well, yeah, I mean, remember too, like this could be the first of a series of peps. Um, and I think, you know, I, I don't know why that was in or not in the pep, but, um, you know, talking to the PEP authors would probably be much better um, assessment of that. But I think we've decided like we want to have it and be successful and then we can always expand upon it later. Anyways, I'm super excited about it. So cool. Uh, I hope it will. I am uh, too. Land. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so cross your fingers. <laughs> uh, so let's have a question uh, from our audience because uh, they ask them quite a lot and you can probably <laughs> you can probably already know the most popular question it is about Gil so do you have any like insights about it or maybe some thoughts about it or we can just say that it is not a cursing it is a blessing and continue on <laughs> so you know, I think it is a concept that came out of another time. I mean, Python is a 30 year old language. So some of the decisions that um, made the language successful when it was younger and made the ease of use of Python and the flexibility of Python, you know, some of that had to do with the object model and how the GIL um, enabled that. And, you know, I mean, Python at the time was unlike C or C++ or Java in the fact that it was much more syntactically clean and much visually, more visually clean. So I think, you know, there's things like Cython that let you speed up parts of Python when you need to. Um, I think there's been discussion about, um, 
you know, a different, different implementations of sort of the uh, language kernel, like the, the virtual machine, um, you know, is Python going to have the same performance as Go? It depends on how you define performance. If you're talking raw processing speed, you know, C, um, anything that's C based heavily is going to win. Um, but if you're talking about the productivity in which you put together a project and you maintain a project, I think Python wins almost hands down in all of those situations because of its readability, because of the rich ecosystem of libraries. And, um, you know, as Dustin's been saying, the educated community around Python and the willingness to share knowledge makes it really powerful. So the gill, I am, you know, the gillectomy has been worked on by folks. Um, I don't know what's going to be the ultimate solution if I look out four or five years, but um, I think it's safe to say that Python is working on ways to increase um, uh, performance in raw processing power. And some of that is going to be done through funding that we hope that the PSF and the core team working together will be able to um, fund. Yeah. I love the answer. I want to add also, I mean, it's great to be able to have something high performance from inside of Python, the comfort and safety of the language. But Python also has really powerful tools that allow you to continue using Python, but then drop down to, mm -hmm. you know, a higher performing language if you need to. Um, this is sort of one of the like core features uh, mm -hmm. of, of Python, what made Python successful, what made third party projects like NumPy and things successful. Um, and so, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I see that as like really the more powerful uh, question is like we need to make those things easier as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, the I also work on the Jupiter project, and the notebooks have been um, just wildly popular beyond any of our initial expectations, and I think it's because it it gives a different way of showcasing. Um, the different libraries that we have and um, presents it in a different way to folks that maybe aren't uh, CS folks by training, but are instead coming from other science disciplines, other social sciences. And, um, and it, it's as much about the prose that surrounds the code as the code itself and the visualizations. By the way, I think that uh, Jupyter Notebooks is one of the most important features in Python, and I use it widely, not in the ways it was supposed to be used. <laughs> I really like uh, to make technical decisions in uh, Jupyter Notebooks and to write blog posts in there. So thanks a lot for building it, because it is great. And, so, and I think that's a good thing. It, it, it illustrates how important community is, because the Jupyter project, in terms of Several years ago, the team itself was very small, like under 20 people, certainly closer to 10 people full time. And much of its growth came from the things that people in the community have done. Um, you know, Jeremy Howard with some of the fast AI stuff and, you know, publishing around it, um, you know, writing blog posts, integrating them into websites. All of those things, dashboarding, come from other members other than the core Jupyter team. So um, it has really accelerated our growth. And, and I think that sort of reflects on Python as a whole. That's how Python has evolved. Uh, OK. Uh, there are several more questions from our audience. Uh, Larissa says uh, that she thinks that the future of Python is bright and getting brighter. Uh, thanks, Larissa. Uh, Nitri is asking, uh, do you have any plans in increasing uh, Python speed? Uh, for example, like PHP does. And the second question is, uh, what are your plans in adding extra typing 
uh, for example, final classes, ABC integration, integration, uh, and what about exceptions? So I think we kind of covered the performance and speed yeah. um, in the last question. Um, typing, I personally um, have mixed feelings about typing. Um, I can see its benefits in some large enterprise systems where you want to uh, you know, be able to run some static analysis before on the code. I also, um, as somebody who reviews far more code than I write, I actually find reviewing code that has static typing in it far more, far more complicated visually to review than code without static typing. I also think for beginners, um, you know, one of the things that years ago attracted me to Python was the fact that it didn't have typing in required typing. And, and it doesn't have required typing now, which I think is the absolute right solution going forward. Um, but, you know, there are cases where like um, something like Pydantic, where you're doing like an API and um, you can make it actually a lot quicker and create swagger documents from that if you have the typing in there. And so there are times where typing is really important. Um, what I would love is if somebody made an editor that I could turn on and off typing, I would be in heaven. Um, and, and so hopefully somebody does that at some time because I've been mentioning it quite a lot for you know, folks, because I think, you know, it has a place in production software, but also, you know, in the ad hoc, let me experiment, let me, you know, play around with like CircuitPython or MicroPython. I don't know that it's necessary. I love so that idea. Awesome. I think that's such a great idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I love static typing. I mean, I think it's a really power feature of Python. Uh, I also love that it's optional and can be added gradually. I don't think that's ever going to change. Honestly, I, I think it's always going to be an optional thing, which I think is great. Um, I think the community hasn't totally adopted it into their workflow yet. I think a lot of large enterprise companies that really see the value of static typing when it comes to um, refactoring large code bases that are shared by lots of developers. Uh, it has a lot of benefits there, but the, the average you know, Python user doesn't work for those companies, doesn't have that large of a code base, and they don't quite see the benefits yet. Um, that said, I think a lot of people have seen the benefit and uh, maybe are asking more for more features. But at this point, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what the right path forward is. I think maybe in some time uh, when the community gains a little more adoption of static typing, we'll see new features. Um, Things like type shed, so like typing for third party packages. There's not really a good solution for that right now, right? If you use a package from PyPI, um, it's it's hard to add typing to a project if they don't, they'll already have it added. Um, there are various ways the community can, can contribute to that and add that, but it, it's it's not very user friendly right now. So I, th I think in the future we'll see improvements there, but it, it, like typing, it will happen gradually. Right, and I think you hit on a really important point with when you're refactoring something or you're doing a large code migration, it, it is far simpler to do it with typing added in it, like moving from two to three than not having any typing. Um, you know, so I think, you know, anything that gives you higher quality code, that gives you more options for modification and change are important features. I also think that uh, new projects should arise to increase the adoption of typing, like Pydentic, like authors, like uh, the, the data classes, and things like this, because these are new cool features people really like, and they add types to their applications, and they start to feel this profits from it, and I think that's a, a good path forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. uh, the next question is about uh, Python 4, obviously, because everyone is super excited about uh, 3.8. Okay. 
three nine. Let me let me say <laughs> one thing. Um, I long ago said Python four will be very 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 far in the future. Um, so essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to go. 3.10, 3.11, 3.13. Um, there are no eminent pro look projects looking at a 4.0. Um, I don't think it's in the best interest of the Python community. I think we're doing well by incrementally growing the language and really focusing on its stability. Um, one of the things, one of the peps that went through last year, I believe, was to uh, shorten the release cadence, which I think is a good option, um, making smaller releases, but more like annual releases, instead of having like an 18 or a 24 month uh, release cycle, which is just too big. And it's too big of a jump for um, the people that are using it in you know, a research lab or enterprise um, to have so many changes all at once. So um, I would say for, you know, plan on Python 4 somewhere out in like 2100 or something. <laughs> I also okay. heard it said that Python 4 will be the most boring Python release ever. Uh, uh, I don't know who said that. Hopefully, but. yeah, I think it was Guido that said it. Was it Guido? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Uh, I think if Python 4 ever exists, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a core developer, so I don't really have a lot of uh, input here, but I think if Python 4 ever exists, it will be nothing like the two to three uh, change. It, it won't be nearly as disruptive or uh, 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 has have a, as high of a change log. Right, and I, I think it was an excellent question about Python 4, because as we look from 3.9 forward, it seems like, oh, maybe you would go to 4, but um, in fact, we're actually doing sort of a PR push right now to really articulate that 4 is not on the horizon. 3.10, 3.11 are on the horizon. Guido actually tweeted uh, this uh, exact tweet yesterday or maybe two days ago, something mm -hmm. like this. So. Yeah. Um, Justin, you've mentioned that you're not a core developer, but a lot of people uh, want to become one because it's really cool. Uh, so, <laughs> what what uh, should a person do to become a core developer of Python? I, yeah, I can't answer you know, that. I don't know. Yeah, I, I I have some interesting opinions on this because I work on a lot of projects other than Python, and um, becoming a Python core developer. Yes, it's nice. Um, it is wonderful if you're kind of a language geek and want to, you know, improve a language, kind of get into the guts of the language. Um, Anthony Shaw has a new book out that is outstanding at kind of breaking down and explaining how the language is put together. Um, but if you don't want to be involved with the language itself, um, I think there are so many opportunities to contribute to things like, you know, PyPI, to NumPy, to the whole ecosystem of projects. So remember, Python's primary goal is to be stable first, feature second. And I think in other projects, you're going to see a faster uh, cycle time from you know, PR to implementation um, and have a lot more autonomy in what gets added to those projects. So in some ways, I'm not discouraging folks from becoming Python core developers. Clearly, we love to have them and we are doing things to actively um, grow the pipeline of people that are core developers. But I think the experience that you gain on some of the other projects, particularly if you can become a maintainer of a project, that opens up a whole new world of experiences, um, is v really valuable. And I think oftentimes gets overlooked in the, I want to contribute to Python because Python's the big, huge thing. Um, so. 
Yeah. I'll Justin also say Zuck. that, yeah, the potential for impact is a lot higher for with the you know, amount of time and energy you can put into an external project versus core Python. So I actually made an active decision at one point not to pursue becoming a core developer and not, not because, you know, I didn't, like the people that are core developers, or I didn't want to be a core developer, but I found that um, my time could probably be better spent elsewhere uh, on other projects that needed more help and eventually have a larger impact on the overall community. So for me, that was Python packaging and working on PyPI. And you know, I'm really proud of all the stuff that has changed in the ecosystem, uh, in the packaging ecosystem since then. Obviously, I don't, I don't claim responsibility for all of it, but I was I've been super You're involved a with it for a long it, time. Though. Yeah, it's gotten a lot better. And, you know, I think I don't think that if I had spent the same amount of time being a core developer, there would have been as an improvement in the overall ecosystem. So I, I also don't want to encourage people or discourage people from becoming core developers. I mean, we obviously always need more volunteers all across all of Python. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of projects where the need is much greater and the impact can be much potentially much higher. Yeah. yeah, and then the other thing with Core Python is what I've been whining about since probably 2014 is we need to improve the workflow and processes around Python so that it fits into a modern workflow and um, you know moving to GitHub the the code base that's been a first step and a really good one because it's opened up all these automated tools so that people can contribute more easily because they're getting testing done and they're you know, seeing what the CI brings back um, from those continuous tests. And um, I think you know, my hope is when we add the bug tracker in there as well, um, it will be even easier for people to who really want to be core developers to have the ability to do so. Uh, can you please uh, tell a little bit more about this process? Because I heard that it was, it was a really big project. It was uh, paid uh, or it was planning to be play, paid by someone and some company. Right. So, I mean, you could imagine moving 30 years of bug history, issue history, PR history, um, from one type of platform to another. And that's not a trivial process. And you know, also recognizing that you want to have it in an open format so that if you ever had to move it out of that, like if, you know, for whatever reason, GitHub became, I don't know, it didn't exist anymore we need to move to something else or self-host um, and we need the options to do that. So um, as well as not disrupting too much the workflows of the existing core developers, but bringing into you know, the process, the workflows that people are used to that maybe in their 20s, 30s, you know, more modern tools. Uh, there's a lot of new tooling as a result of JavaScript's growth as well. And um, I think one of the things by bringing in additional funding or managed uh, project management of this transition, sometimes being a volunteer means you can't dedicate like a known quantity of time, you're more flexible. Whereas if you have a project that you're running, you really want a project manager that can give you continuity over time. And really the most effective way of doing that is to make it a paid position. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Uh, I've been involved in a number of Python PSF related projects and I can say without a doubt, the number one best use of our money when funded by external organizations was hiring a project manager to oversee the project and maintain mm -hmm. that continuity is incredibly effective. Yeah, I mean, PyPI is the perfect example of that, so. Yes. Uh, there is also one more question about uh, Python code developers and uh, all these uh, activities around it. Uh, a lot of people 
are totally sure that you have to know C language to actually become a Python core developer. Is it true or you can just focus on other things? Yeah. Um, I would say there was probably one time in Python's history that that was true. It's no longer true. Uh, the majority of the code base is in Python. It's a very small amount that is actually in C. And it's really when you're getting down to the real internals where you're kind of manipulating hardware um, and in some cases memory. And, you know, I think, like I said before, like reading like Anthony's blog post or Anthony Shaw's book really sh illustrates very well where C is needed and where C isn't needed. And like the vast majority of the standard library isn't, C is not needed. So I don't know if you have more thoughts on that, Dustin. Yeah, I mean, especially a lot of the stuff that is, um, you know, the things like disk details, but th there are other projects that are built into the standard library, and almost all of those are in pure Python. Yeah. So uh, contribute to Python if, even if you don't know C, uh, it's not going to be a problem. So Not at all. <laughs> Take it from Python Code Europa and Python Director. Um, one more question uh, about Python Core Developers, and we will uh, switch to something else if we will have the time. Uh, how uh, does this Python Core Developer and PSF Director titles change your life and your career? Uh, is it a significant? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the short answer is I have a lot less free time uh, because <laughs> I'm spending a lot of time volunteering on stuff. Um, and then, you know, seriously, I think for me, it's been less about it impacting my career and more about being part of building something that's going, that's used by lots of people. Um, you know, I, Python, Jupyter. Um, I always want to see, like, if people have great ideas for building stuff, I think it's really cool if you can provide them the tools to do so. And um, so it might get me invited to more conferences or more speaking engagements. But at the end of the day, um, I'm not sure that it has helped or harmed my career in any way. This is just Justin? an interesting path to follow, I think. Yeah. I, so I, I recently became a director of the PSF. I would say that. In some ways, it's helped my career, and in some ways, uh, just all of the volunteer time I've put in has actually maybe hurt a little bit. I, I know that there's been times when I've been in a job interview, and I'm like, yeah, I'm super involved. Uh, I've put in a lot of volunteer time, and employers sort of see that as like, oh, you want to do a bunch of work for somebody else. Uh, are you going to do that on company time, or are you going to do that in free? Like, it's almost like a liability, uh, someone that's that involved and isn't getting paid to do it. Uh, I think a lot of employers don't understand uh, how to encourage their employees to contribute to open source and, and reward that as well. But um, for my current job, so I'm a developer advocate for the Python community at Google. And you know my experience with the community definitely um, helped me get that job, right? I have to understand the community and how it works and the infrastructure and tools inside of it. But no part of my job description says I should become a director of the board. Uh, and in fact, like Carol said, it just means that I am doing more work uh, that and, and like spending more time working on stuff that isn't actually in my job description. So uh, I think it's important for the community and, and is one way that I can contribute and be a part of the community, but uh, it's definitely not required. <laughs> well, and you know, an interesting thing, I'm watching Dustin as he's saying this and the whole time he's smiling. And <laughs> you know, what, what makes it valuable, I think to me is I love doing it. I love, you know, merging, not merging code per se on GitHub, but bringing together code and empowering people. And that's, that's something that I can't do everywhere. But the fact that I can do it here is what motivates me. And the things that I see coming out of the community and um, core developers that come to me and say, oh, you merged my first pull request and you were really nice to me. Um, 
those things are huge. I mean, they seem tiny, but then you go and see them, what they, people blossom into. Um, it's really humbling. And I think in many ways, Guido was like that for me. There were times in my career where I'm like, eh, not really enjoying what I'm doing. And he's like, you know, you don't have to do that. You can do something <laughs> else. And it was like, he was the only person that said something like that. And it was like, you know what? You're right. So, yeah. Uh, it's I'll, a labor I'll of love. The, absolutely. I'll second also that the, the really small interactions go a really long way and, and sort of how we treat uh, other people in the community as well. So re recently, maybe a year ago or so ago, I started, whenever I merged a pull request, I'd say thanks to the person that did it. I'd just leave a little comment. And you know, I, I, I think I saw someone else doing it. I thought, oh, that's nice. And I started doing it. And recently someone said to me, no one's ever thanked me for my pull request before. Yeah. Uh, like that felt really good. Like I had never been thanked for it before. And I thought, wow, like I wonder how many people had that same reaction where they go and work on a project and then someone just hits merge. And, you know, I'm sure they appreciate the contribution, but uh, it's not as explicit online when you don't know the person and you don't right. know the project as well, maybe. So. Yeah, small stuff like that goes a really long way. It really does. And it's something, you know, I brought to Jupiter early on was, you know, hey, saying please, saying thank you to contributors, they are taking their time to do this. We should at least respect their time. And in return, they should also respect our time. Like if you're rude to me on an issue tracker, I don't care how good your PR is, I'm not going to merge it. So, yeah, somebody Genius. else might, but it not, ain't going to be me. <laughs> um, I'm nowhere near uh, like a Python core developer, but I run some small open source projects and I understand what, what you're talking about because I treat my open source project uh, as something I really enjoy working on. I enjoy my work as well, but this is mm -hmm. something I want to work on. Like, I constantly think about these projects and think about new features, um, how to fix a bug, and that's just a, a path to enjoy, not something you should purchase it as a goal. So, Thanks a lot for uh, this in inspirational part, because it is really valuable for the developers, for someone who is going to start a new project or contribute to an existing one, because who knows uh, who we are going to inspire by this. Well, and that's exactly the case. And I want to make sure that if somebody's passion is to, to contribute to core Python, they should be persistent. Um, they should be polite, but persistent. Um, because recognize that you're working with a lot of people that are um, have very little free time. And the time they devote to Python, they're going to use um, most efficiently. And so um, reading the dev guide, um, looking at talks that are on YouTube about core development will give you the foundation you need to begin contributing. So please contribute. If not to core Python, any other Python project. Yeah. OK. Uh, so we are running out of time. I really appreciate. Uh, that you answered uh, all our questions. Not all our questions, but <laughs> a big part of it. <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot for your work, uh, for your contributions to Python, to its community and organizations around it. We really appreciate it. And I hope one day we will meet in person on our real life conference, because this is going to be uh, sometime in the future. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for putting the conference together. It uh, seems really awesome. Uh, a whole week of Python is uh, an incredible event. It's an absolute treat. And it's some of the funnest times I've had have been conferences and um, what I've learned, the people I've met. And so I really thank you for including me. Um, Dustin, thank you for putting up with me. And um, <laughs> it's, it's been a pleasure as always. So. Likewise. OK. So uh, if you have any questions for our guests, uh, you can 
uh, drop. Uh, do you have any context to reach you? Because we are not having any slides to show them, but I guess we can just say it out loud. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, it's di underscore codes, C-O-D-E-S. Uh, and I'm also on GitHub as at di. Yeah, and as well, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Willing Carol, so the same name you see in the corner, just flipped. And on GitHub and pretty much everywhere else, I am Willing C. And um, I check GitHub more than I check anything else. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> no, <that's laughs> so uh, follow our guests on Twitter and on GitHub. Ask any questions uh, if you have them. Uh, please contribute to the Python and its ecosystem and be awesome. Thanks a lot for uh, coming and see you soon. See you online. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.